In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. We're at the 14th week after Pentecost, that long season that stretches for half of the year. This year, clear to December 3rd, when Advent begins. We're just a little bit past the midpoint, so we have 12 more weeks or Sundays to go. And as I've said before, I continue to think of this long season as the season of discipleship. And I say that because we learn over this half year, these Old Testament stories. We learn from the acts of the early Christians, and we learn from the ministry of Jesus what it means to respond to God's call. So over the three-year lectionary cycle, half of that time is spent in this long season that our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters call ordinary time. It's ordinary life, in fact. In the Old Testament reading this morning, in the book of Exodus, Exodus, we have this well-known story of one person's response to God's call, the response of Moses. And as you just heard uh, at the first reading, it's the burning bush story. How many of you are familiar with that? Sure. In a nutshell, the story goes this way. Moses is shepherding, he's tending the flock of his father-in-law near a mountain, and he sees a bush that's burning, but which is not consumed by the fire. Out of curiosity, he goes to see it, and there God speaks to him out of that burning bush and commands him to go back to Egypt and rescue his people. Moses resists a little bit, and as a result, we hear a conversation between God and Moses going back and forth which includes God sharing God's name. And so begins this story of Moses' call to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. I see at least three themes or perhaps faith questions that we could answer, helping us to be better disciples. First, how does God reveal himself? How does God make himself known? We know there are other accounts in the Old Testament of God making himself known, usually through some dramatic appearance at a holy place. Think, for example, some of you will remember this, of Mount Sinai, when later in the story of Moses, Moses brings the people to the holy mountain, and God appears. How does he appear? He appears in smoke and fire, and the mountain quakes. It's high drama at the mountain of God. Our burning bush story is also high drama. Moses stands in the presence of God. It is frightening. Just Moses and God. And God speaks out of the bush, and Moses, obeying God's command, removes his shoes because he is told he is on holy ground. And as God speaks, Moses hides his face in fear, fear of death from seeing the face of God. And yet... After initially making himself known, God then speaks to Moses as a personal God, the God of the Hebrew ancestors, because he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So if we ask the question, how does God reveal himself? How does God make himself known? Based on our reading, first, God does this by being transcendent. In other words, he goes beyond our normal or physical human experiences. God is not limited to our human, often limited expectation. After all, God just spoke from a bush. And secondly, in the revelation of God, God finds a way to identify with us personally, a particular person or people. God is personal. He says, Moses, Moses. And he says, and I am the God, the God of your ancestors. He relates Moses to that. So the second question I would ask in this reading, who is God and how should we address God? Moses asked God, if I come to the people of Israel, as you are asking, and say to them, 
The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And then they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God responds, I am who I am, which is a little hard to understand. But then God adds, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And then finally, God gets personal. Say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Ah, now we understand, Moses. Historically, we have divided Moses' life into three 40-year periods. That's because the Bible tells us that he died when he was 120 years old. 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, and then 40 years leading the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt toward the Promised Land. So in our story this morning, the burning bush story, Moses is 80 years old when God declares to him who he is. A third question we might ask and answer is, after the appearance of God and after the revelation of God's name, is God's call to Moses and how Moses will respond? Will Moses accept God's call to him to lead the people out of Egypt? It's clear why God is making the call. We're told in the reading that God has heard the cries of the people in Egypt and to bring them out to a land of their own, a land flowing with that wonderful phrase, milk and honey. God, moreover, God wants Moses to be the instrument of that action, to bring them out of Egypt. Moses resists. He says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Good question. After all, Moses fled Egypt because he had killed an Egyptian and was wanted for murder. And he's been gone 40 years. But I think there's a deeper issue. That is whether Moses believes he is really worthy of the call. The Old Testament has a number of examples of just this problem or question. It is common, you may remember this, it is common at ordinations to have a reading from the prophet Jeremiah. And let me read to you a portion of that. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. Obviously, we all feel unworthy to some extent when we're called by God, because we're called by God. So having reviewed the Old Testament lesson this morning briefly and entertaining these three questions, what are we to make of this and how can the burning bush story help us in our faith journey? Well, two thoughts. First, perhaps we need to reflect on holy ground. God said to Moses, take your sandals off for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. A number of religious traditions require the removal of footwear before entering worship space, holy ground. For example, Islam, it's an act of reverence and respect. And when Moses removed his sandals, he's, he's not then standing on a rug or on a tile. He's standing on soil, he's standing on the earth. As one commentator has said about this, quote, this first revelation of sacred space identifies as holy the soil itself. God's good land alive with vegetation. If you have environmental concerns, as I have, then Moses standing on holy ground may present a deeper meaning for you, something to reflect on. The soil is holy because it nourishes the life from which God speaks. A second thought, at the very beginning of the reading from Exodus, we're told that Moses led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. In the King James Version of the Bible, that wonderful translation from the 17th century and which our Revised Standard Version flows from, the phrase west side of the wilderness is translated differently 
It's translated in the King James Version as the backside of the desert. The backside of the desert. And if you look up the word backside in the dictionary, it says a person's bottom. <laughs> the backside of the desert. It suggests that Moses led the flock into an area where there was little or no vegetation. We're not told why he uh, went there. All we know is he's gotten his flock there and there's not much to graze on. So metaphorically, have you ever, through your own actions or those of others, ended up in a place of little nourishment? Too little physical, emotional, or spiritual nourishment? Your own desert backside? It's here in the backside of life that God wants to make himself known. But we have to pay attention. Remember, Moses not only saw the burning bush, but he took the next step. He said, I will turn aside and go and see this great sight. Moses is not afraid of curiosity. So will we take that next step to slow down and pay attention to what may be one of God's surprises? Much like the burning bush story this morning. Barbara Brown Taylor, an Episcopal priest and a noted uh, spiritual writer, in one of her books talks about her youth about taking out the garbage when she, was, when she passed a scruffy little spot in the yard that was suddenly fantastically transformed by sunlight. She could never grow anything there. It was like a door to another world, she writes. I had to go through it. I knew that I did. Then I would become golden too. But first I had to ditch the trash bag. And ditch it she did, but in the brief meantime that magical light shifted just enough to return the spot to its former, shall we say, shabbiness, nothing growing there. She writes, the garden was no longer on fire. And while I made my task my first priority, the fire moved on in search of someone who would stop what she was doing, take off her shoes, and say, here, I am I. here I am I. In the backside of the desert, Moses paid attention to the burning bush, God waiting for him. In our time, in the backside of the desert, in our time, Jesus calls us in the same way. He calls us to reach out to those who are in those desert experiences that they're at. They need Christian nourishment. So we remember Moses this morning in the burning bush story, and we remember Jesus' call to us as well. Amen.